Welcome to the Why I Love America podcast. We are the Paul Brothers, and we have an awesome guest today, uh, Mr. Tad R. Collister, who has written several different books and things that advocate for the actual teaching of history, as I would say. What is the, the main book that you put out recently about American history that everyone should read? Well, it's entitled America's Destiny, mm-hmm. and it's designed to uh, go to primary sources to find the truth rather than relying on secondary sources or one's own opinion. Mm-hmm. Which my, my mother-in-law, she actually sent me one of your books while I was on a military activation, and it was America's Destiny, because there was two versions of it, right? Yes. Okay, I think she sent me the first one, but that was the first time I had ever learned anything like that about Christopher Columbus because of this narrative around Columbus just being an absolute demon of a man. And so your book kind of gave me some resources to where I could learn kind of the other side. Yeah, so tell us a little bit, because... As Jackson pointed out, the the general concept around Christopher Columbus that's being taught in the schools is that he was seeking merely earthly gain. He wanted to look cool, and he wanted to have a bunch of money. And when he came over, he just wanted to enslave people so that he could get more money and look more cool, right? And that's kind of the idea that they put forward with Christopher Columbus. But what you're saying is that is not the case. There's Christopher Columbus is a much more complicated and uh, richer personality than the, just that. That's true. And I'm just a common guy who wanted to find out the truth about Columbus. Mm -hmm. So I ordered all of the books that I could find on Columbus, the primary sources that are in English. Mm -hmm. And one was uh, the the diary and letters of Christopher Columbus, because I wanted to find out what he himself said. Interesting. Another was a biography by his son who accompanied him on some of his voyages, Ferdinand Columbus. Another, probably the most uh, acclaimed, was by a uh, Spanish historian and a friar named Bartolome de las Casas, yeah. who lived in Hispaniola, which now is known as Dominican Republic, in Haiti, and had uh, and defended the Indians, but also gave us a uh, what I would call a correct analysis of Columbus. Columbus, and he points out the Spaniards. We're terrible with the natives, mm-hmm. but he has a completely different viewpoint of Columbus, Columbus as an individual. Another uh, one of the original sources, I don't have the book with me, was by someone named Peter Martyr, who was an Italian historian. And another one was Andre Bernaldes, who was a uh, Spanish historian and uh, archbishop. And then one that was most helpful was uh, written by an emeritus professor at Stanford. Her name is Carol Delaney. She read all the original sources about Columbus and probably is the greatest expert in the world today on Columbus and who he really was Mm -hmm. and what he really accomplished. So maybe we can... So we're we're standing on a solid foundation then, is what you're (laughs) pointing We're going to refer to primary sources mainly and some secondary sources who quote the primary sources to find out who was this who, guy, who Columbus? Who Columbus really is. Okay, let's do it. I'm excited. Well, I think one important thing is, what was Columbus's motive in sailing west? Mm-hmm. Now, certainly he wanted to get to the Indies and find the riches for Spain. But why did he want to find all of those riches, and what else did he want to accomplish? So this is what Samuel Eliot Morrison said. He was a, uh, a Pulitzer Prize biographer on the life of Columbus, and maybe one of you could read that for us, what he said about Columbus. Samuel Eliot Morrison, he said, There can be no doubt that the faith of Columbus was genuine and sincere, and that his frequent communion with forces unseen was a vital element in his achievement. This conviction that God destined him to be an instrument for spreading the faith was far more potent than the desire to win glory, wealth, and worldly honors to which he was certainly far from indifferent. Well, as I read, I found out that Columbus had two main motives in sailing west. One was to convert the indigenous people to Christianity. Okay. And you know what the second one was? What's that? I have a cool story. (laughs) (laughs) To use the gold to reconquer Jerusalem so they could build a temple for the second coming of no Christ. Way. I have never now heard that. let's read. You don't read about that in your school books. No, that's pretty wild. But let's just go on and read a little more. This is Columbus who said, I feel persuaded by the many and wonderful manifestations of divine providence in my special favor that I am the chosen instrument of God in bringing to pass a great event, no less than the conversion of millions 
who are now existing in darkness of paganism. Mm. Now, Carol Delaney, who was the Stanford professor who wrote this book, maybe you could read what she had to say about, after reading all the original sources, what did she have to say about Columbus? Yeah. Carol bodies? Delaney, she said, Columbus had time to think about the meaning of the journey and his role in it. He was beginning to think of himself as the Christ bearer, like his namesake, Saint Christopher, carrying the Christian faith across the waters. So is she saying that Christopher, like the etymology of it, literally means Christ bearer? Yes. Interesting. Wow. That's very interesting. Interesting that that should be attached to his his name. To his name. Right. Wow. Well, so, now, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask. So for those uh, who are listening, Christopher Columbus, because there may be some critics that are listening, they're like, okay, well, yeah, maybe he did have this religious thing, but religion bad. And that's what a lot of people in today's society thinks. It's religion bad. What what um, Christopher Columbus his his goal wasn't to go and force everybody into Christianity or anything like that. It was to share the good news, correct? And 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 how did how was that received when he he got over there? Well, we're going to talk a little bit about how it was received. And uh, but let me have you uh, cite one of the quote that talks about how he wanted the profits from the gold to be used. Mm -hmm. Why don't you read Columbus there? Columbus said, I urge your highness, highnesses to spend all the profits of this, my enterprise, on the conquest of Jerusalem. Being a devoutly religious man, Columbus believed this conquest and the rebuilding of the temple was necessary in order to prepare the way for the second coming of Christ. Mm -hmm. Yes. So he had two great goals, one to convert the people to Christianity to a higher way of life, and two, reconquer Jerusalem and rebuild the temple and prepare for the second coming of Christ. Hmm. Now, in a letter to the Pope, 1493, Columbus writes, This enterprise was undertaken with the purpose of expending what was invested in aiding or rebuilding the Holy Temple and the Holy Church. You don't find that anywhere in Howard Zinn or the school teachings mm -hmm. today. So, uh, at one point, Carol Delaney, who was the leading expert on Columbus, was asked a very interesting question in an interview. Alan Pulaski said, The popular view today is that Columbus is responsible for countless atrocities against the native people. Mm -hmm. Pulaski asked her if she felt this was a fair assessment. What'd she say? Would you like to know? Yes. Yeah. This is her answer. No, not at all. The more I read of his own writings and that, and that of his contemporaries, the primary sources, my understanding of him totally changed. His relations with the natives tended to be benign or good. He liked the natives and found them to be very intelligent. Christopher strictly told the crew not to do things like maraud or rape and instead to treat the native people with respect. There are many examples in his writings where he gave instructions to this effect. Most of the time, when justices, injustices occurred, Columbus wasn't even there. She then added, the critics are blaming Columbus for things he didn't do. I just think he's been terribly maligned. Mm -hmm. That's her summary after reading all of the original sources. Okay. Wow, and, and I'm I'm curious. You mentioned a guy, uh, Howard Zinn. You said yes. So, how has he participated in kind of that muddling of Christopher Columbus's history, or it helped me understand that? Yes, he's taken a very secular view. He never mentions that uh, Columbus wanted to use the funds to promote Christianity or the retaking of the temple. It was solely because he was greedy. Mm -hmm. And he wanted the money for himself and for fame and for Spain. Mm -hmm. He neglects all of these other aspects of what motivated Columbus. In fact, uh, La Casas, who was the lead historian at the time, summarizes uh, Columbus's life a little bit in these words. And in fact, this is a very critical statement he makes about the Columbus in distinguishing him from the other Spaniards who could, did commit genocide. Mm -hmm. Could you read this starting right there, the desolation? Yes. The desolation of these isles and providences, Hispaniola, took beginning about the year 1504. Okay, that's the second. He's now saying the bad things started to happen in 1504. You know why that year is important? No. Is that when Christopher Columbus left? Christopher Columbus had four voyages mm -hmm. 
the last one completed in 1504. Oh, really? So now what uh, <clears throat> Lacoste is saying, the prime historian, before 1504, there's really few problems. The real problem started after 1504. When Columbus was no longer there. Exactly. Wow. It says, about the year 1504, after Columbus's four voyages were completed and at the time when he had no administrative responsibilities in the New World, for before that time, when Columbus governed in part, very few of the provinces situated in that island were oppressed or spoiled with unjust wars or violated with general devastation as after they were. Huh. Interesting. So the the things that we hear that the Spaniards d- did to the natives when they came across, they, they really, really started after Christopher Columbus was no longer there. Yeah, so I'm not saying none of it happened because Columbus, when he would sail back to Spain, he would leave some of his men and they would do bad things, even though he instructed them not to. Yeah. But this historian is saying, hey, I just want you to know that uh, the really terrible things took place after Columbus left. Well, let's talk about these four voyages because I think most people watching that aren't super interested in American history probably didn't know that Columbus did four voyages. They probably thought he did one voyage, went, and he raped and pillaged, and then he went home with all of his gold. But that is not the case. There were four voyages, and they weren't all the same, if I remember correctly, right? In fact, maybe for a minute we could focus on the second voyage because there's an an interesting event that took place. Okay, let's do it. One of the uh, local tribes helped save one of his ships. It was shipwrecked. And then they said, can you help us out? Because there's a tribe over here that are cannibals. And they come and they take our women and children and eat our men. Can you help us conquer them? So Columbus uh, helped conquer them and takes the prisoners of war, and uh, he sends them back to Spain. Mm -hmm. People call these slaves. We would call them prisoners Prisoners of of war. war. Because they were literally eating. Literally (laughs) eating. In fact, we have the first-hand account of Dr. Chanko, who was a physician of the royal court, who was there and describes how they would literally eat the men and little children. Which uh, I will say this, that the general uh, idea of the the natives and Columbus are Columbus came over, all the natives are living in perfect peace and harmony with the land and with each other. (laughs) And then Columbus comes in and just enslaves them all. But this very much shows that even the natives were fighting among themselves and eating each other. They were fighting among themselves. They had cannibals. They were sacrificing some of their children, as we'll see, to the gods that Uh they had. Yeah. But uh, this is what Columbus says. He sends these cannibals back to Spain. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever reads this letter. Can you read what he says to the king and queen there? About the, yep. Okay. We send these two vessels, some of these cannibal men and women, as well as some children, both male and female, their highnesses can order them to be placed under the care of the most competent persons to teach them the language. Columbus then explained in his motives for sending these prisoners of war, that they may one day be led to abandon their barbarous custom of eating their fellow creatures. By learning the Spanish language in Spain, they will much earlier receive baptism and ensure the salvation of their souls. Moreover, it will be a great happiness to the Indians who do not practice the above-mentioned cruel custom, cannibalism, when they see that when... Uh, that we have seized and led captive those who injure them, whom they dread so much that their name also fills them with horror. So that's that's really interesting. Columbus isn't like, take them and enslave them and kill them. He's saying, these people are wicked and they're eating other people. Please teach them Spanish. And, and give te- them real food. And give them real food so they don't have to eat <laughs> and people anymore. And teach them Christianity. And, just, yeah. mm-hmm. and then he wants to send them back to reclaim their people. Yes. Holy now, God. to get a feel for this evil man, Columbus, that you hear about in schools, mm-hmm. let's go to another original source. This is Peter Martyr, an mm-hmm. Italian historian. And what does he say right there? Okay. Peter Martyr says, um, as he had never mistreated the natives, the inhabitants of Cuba. Both what did men. he just say? Is he what? As he had never mistreated the natives and the inhabitants of Cuba, both men and women gladly brought him gifts to Wow. No fear. He never what? He never mistreated them. So when he came yeah. back, the natives were excited to see Columbus again. A little different than what you get in so the, they've given in the gifts, school book. Displaying no fear. Okay. Because if I, if I remember right, his first, his first uh, trip... He lands there. He meets these. Na- he meets the natives. He they are friends. There's no conflict in, on the first trip, right? And then he leaves his men behind and goes back to Spain to report. 
And then when he comes back, th- some things that happened, right? What what were those things that, that he found when he came back on his second voyage? Well, he did find at one point that, uh, I've forgotten if it was the second or third voyage, but that 39 of his men were dead. Mm-hmm. All of them, right? So, it was all of them were dead. So he went out to war against those who had killed his men. Mm-hmm. Yes. So it wasn't this unprovoked, he comes over and he's like, all right, now, I, I was nice the first time, but the second time it'd be mean. He leaves men behind, le- goes back to Spain, comes back, and all of them are dead. And they, they had all and they were killed. killed by the natives? They were killed by the natives. Yeah. And so, but even then, so yes, there was warring, but eventually they came to an agreement and a peace, and it was on that second voyage that he helped them out with uh, the cannibalism. The cannibals. Right? And so eventually they made peace once again. In fact, I, uh, Howard Zinn talks about how he went from island to island capturing the natives. Mm-hmm. I couldn't find one instance where he just took innocent people as captives and sent them back to Spain. Now, on the first voyage, he did take some people back. Okay. And honestly, I don't know because he wanted to show the king and queen of Spain what they were like. What they found, yeah. I don't know what the circumstances were, and it's hard from the original writings to find out. Mm-hmm. But Raphael, who is a historian, uh, I don't know where I have it here, but he went on to say he never captured innocent people. Mm-hmm. And in fact, on the third voyage, Columbus was sent back in chains. Yeah. Talk about himself. that. Himself. And why? part of it was because he caused two of his men to be hanged. Mm. You know why? Because they mistreated the natives. <laughs> oh, really? Yes. So Interesting. Well, uh, just another thought is I, I listed out a lot of the misstatements that were made by mm. the uh, revisionist historians, such, as, to the mice, such as Columbus introduced slavery to the uh, New World. Mm-hmm. Well, that's interesting. The primary sources talk about when the Spaniards came, what do you think the natives gave them as gifts? Slaves? Slaves. No way. <laughs> exactly right. So it's totally false statement. That they brought slaves over. I, that's, that is something that is completely false, this idea that slavery didn't exist until Europeans came over to the Americas, and they're like, hey, I got an idea. Let's figure this out. When it's like slavery, unfortunately, has been something that has existed since the beginning of time, yes. and it's, uh, it's really sad. So I, I, I took a lot of these revisionist statements and I talked about uh, the misconception they were when you read the primary sources. Mm-hmm. And I gave it to one of my grandsons okay. who was in college. Mm-hmm. And he said, okay, okay, Grandpa. Uh, I admit the, the re- revisionists were wrong on these. But we know Columbus was involved in the sex slave trade. Mm-hmm. I said, how do we know that? And he said, we have a quote from his own diary. And uh, Let's read this quote. Uh, in fact, why don't you just read... Starting right there for one woman. Yeah. All right. So this is uh, this is his uh, diary. He says uh-huh. for one woman they give a hundred castellanos as for a farm, and this sort of trading is very common. And there are already a great number of merchants who go in search of girls. There are at this moment from nine or ten on sale. They fetch a good price. Let their age be what it will. But revisionists quote this statement out of context. Okay, continue. Okay, now. Talk about the context. I asked my uh, grandson, did you read the sentence right before and the sentence a few after? He said, no, that's not on the internet. (laughs) I said, would you like to know what they say? I say, the sentence before says that Spain should only send men of honor and integrity to the colonies. And a few sentences later, it says, men such as these are not worthy of Christian baptism. So do you think he was endorsing an event or reporting it and condemning it? Reporting it. Can we 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 read these? Let's read these if we can. The the sentences. So this is the sentence before. He said, it would be well to send people from Spain and only to send such as are well known that the country may be peopled with honest men. And then after making a reference to the women being sold into slavery, he observed, I aver... I don't know what that means. I that a great number of men have been to the Indies who did not deserve baptism in the eyes of God or men and who are now returning thither. In other words, it seems Columbus was condemning, not condoning such actions. So he's pretty much just saying, This is this is what's happening. They're selling women and they sell them for this price. And we shouldn't be sending people that are going to buy women at that price over. Here. Right. But if you quote it out of context, you don't give the bad. introduction and the follow-up. Uh-huh. It sounds like he's involved in the sex life yeah. trade. But we don't have one case of a historical case of Columbus having a slave or mistreating 
any of these natives by abusing them in a hmm. sexual anyway. way. What did your grandkid change his mind? He was surprised. Yeah, <laughs> he was surprised. Take that to school. <laughs> also, I think another interesting point I didn't know is when Columbus uh, wrote his will, he donated money to be used to build a, a church and a hospital for the indigenous natives. So mm. that showed how much he, he loved them. And uh, I would just say, in terms of him being inspired, this is what he wrote about God's hand in his enterprise. <clears throat> he said, with a hand that could be felt, the Lord opened my mind to the fact that it would be possible to sail from here to the Indies and opened my will to desire to accomplish the project. This was the fire that burned within me. Who can doubt that this fire was not merely mine, but also of the Holy Spirit, urging me to press forward? Hmm. Wow. He knew that the Holy Ghost was inspired, was inspiring him in this calling. And then maybe just in conclusion, uh, how do the contemporary historians summarize Columbus's life? Nobody was perfect, and I'm sure he made mistakes along the way and lived in a different culture than we did. But this is La Casas, Bartolome La Casas, who was the greatest defender of the Native American Indians we maybe ever had. He's the one who wrote that book, that In Defense of the Indians. Exactly right. Okay. right. Now he's summarizing uh, Columbus's life, and this is what he says in those two statements. Okay. Here, Lacosta. Lacosta says this, and this is the guy who loves the natives. So, if someone's going to be condemning someone for mistreating the natives, it's exactly the right. And he says, I think Christopher Columbus was the most outstanding sailor in the word, world, versed like no other in the art of navigation, for which divine providence chose him to accomplish the most outstanding feat ever accomplished in the world until now. Many is the time I have wished that God would again inspire me to extol the indescribable service to God and to the whole world which Christopher Columbus rendered at the cost of such pain and dangers, such skill and expertise when he so courageously discovered the new world. So, yeah, he's not saying that this guy was terrible. And then he says, truly this man was a good, had a good and Christian purpose. Well, that's his summary mm -hmm. of Christopher Columbus. Yeah. The one who uh, the school books say was involved in the sex slave, who didn't love the natives. Columbus loved the native people mm -hmm. again and again. He talks about his great love and converting them to the holy faith by, con by persuasion and mm -hmm. love. And then Samuel uh, Elliot Morrison, who was the Pulitzer Prize winner, kind of summarized Columbus's life as follows. All right. Morrison says, <clears throat> the whole history of the Americas stems from the four voyages of Columbus. Today, a score of independent nations and dominions unite in homage to Christopher, who carried Christian civilization across the ocean sea. Yeah. Oh, my God. Here's my question, Tad, is what what is the motivation, I guess, that people have to demonize him so much that we've gotten to this point with the education of him? I think it primarily comes from people who uh, don't have a belief in God's involvement in America, and they don't want to attribute that God inspired Columbus and that Columbus was trying to convert people to Christianity. Hmm. And, uh, and when they weigh their type of life they had versus what Western civilization brought, there were obviously problems. But they were uh, sa they had sacrifices of their own children. They had cannibalism. They had constant wars. In fact, maybe the last statement could be this was a op-ed in the Wall Street Journal by a Peruvian mm -hmm. who looks back on Columbus's life and what he accomplished. And this is what he says in the Wall Street Journal that kind of puts it in yeah. perspective. So this is Alejandro uh, Bermudez. Um, a Peruvian American wrote the op-ed in the Wall Street Journal, and he said, As a Catholic, I particularly value Columbus for bringing the first of many missionaries who showed millions of people the path to salvation. Human sacrifice was not unusual in my home country, as in much of the Americas. In what is now Peru, children were sacrificed by the Incas. Those who hate Columbus and his legacy still must acknowledge that this indigenous practice vanished thanks to the advent of Christianity in their hemisphere. The notion that indigenous life was perfect and Western culture is a locus of all evil is absurd. <laughs> that is strong. That is, that is an amazing testimony right there. And I think that is, that really is amazing that he gets over there. He's finding these cannibalistic people 
And it, it's not that all natives were no, cannibalistic. No. Not all natives no. were sacrificing their children, no, right? Of course not. And, and but he recognized that there were people doing that, and he helped those who were not doing that. And you know, it really. I think you bring up a good point that yes, Western civilization has its flaws, but they're not eating people and sacrificing children. You know what I mean? And I think the other important point is that there was a lot of good native people. Columbus loved them, but they didn't have Christianity. Mm -hmm. And without Christianity, they could never have salvation. Mm -hmm. And he brought that to them. I want to share a quick little anecdote, and then I want to get your thoughts on what you would say to someone who thinks they should tear down Christopher Columbus statues. The first thing I want to share is I was in Hungary recently with my wife, and we were in a place called Liberty Square in Hungary. And I was surprised when I first got in there because there was a statue of Ronald Reagan. And I was like, why is Ronald Reagan here? And I look it up, and the reason they have him there is because they attribute much of the Iron Curtain falling because of Ronald Reagan, yes. that uh, the communists were extolled out of Hungary um, because of Ronald Reagan. And then I walk a little bit further, and I see a statue, and the statue is beautiful. It's massive, and it says, it said something like this. It said, glory to our Soviet heroes who saved us from the Nazi evil. And it was really interesting to me because they had this statue that predated the Ronald Reagan one, obviously talking about how the Soviets saved him from the Nazis, but then it was the Soviets who then put him into communism. But after Ronald Reagan helped bring down the iron curtain, it's not like they tore down the statue to their Soviet heroes either, but somehow they're able to live in a place where the heroism of the Soviets during world war II was what they built that statue to. They didn't build it to the oppression that communism later brought. So I guess what I'm saying is that, yes, our founding fathers may be flawed, but we're not building statues to their flaws. We're bu building statues to the good that they did, and maybe we shouldn't be tearing them down. There's a lot of people that disagree, and what are your thoughts towards those who want to change names of schools from you know, that bear the name of Christopher Columbus, that want to tear down statues that have Christopher Columbus. What would you say to someone that wants to do that? Well, I would say that uh, God works with imperfect men. If he couldn't work with imperfect men, he'd have no one to work with. <laughs> and you look at Peter. If you focus only on his faults, you'd say, oh, this man cut off the ear of the high priest's servant. This man uh, denied knowing the Savior on three occasions. This man, uh, the Savior said, get behind me, Satan. Mm. If that's all you knew about him, you'd tear down the statue. But we know if that's all you knew about him, you would have missed the mark, the man, in his mission. If all you knew about Columbus is a few of his faults, and you miss that he brought Christianity to this world, that he loved the natives, that he wanted to reconquer Ju Jerusalem for a righteous purpose, that in his will he donates money for a church and a hospital. If you focus on the positive, you'll see there's a great man who ought to be honored. Mm. Wow. Cool. That is beautiful. Thank you so much for bringing this knowledge to us. From uh, Especially, I appreciate the primary sources because I, I really do prefer that over people paraphrasing or, you know, people do a good job at reading a lot about someone instead of actually reading the sources in which they documented themselves or firsthand accounts did. And so, well, thank you. You two are terrific, doing a great work. We appreciate it. We appreciate you. Thank you for everyone watching the Why I Love America podcast. And until next time, God bless America. <laughs>